అవునవును ఇచ్చేద్దాం వాళ్ళకి ఎందుకంటే వాళ్ళకు వేరే పని చేస్తే వాళ్ళు వెళ్ళిపోవచ్చు కదా గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఆల్ ద రెస్పెక్టెడ్ తెలంగాణ మెంబర్స్ యాజ్ వెల్ ఆస్ అవర్ ఎస్పెషల్లీ Dr. Vishnu Rao sir from Apollo Hospital Infectious Disease Specialist and Dr. Ashi Madam from uh, Pishpagiri Eye Hospital. She is an ophthalmic plastic surgeon and also others, other uh, uh, specialty doctors who have joined, I don't know, somebody joined. And, and also today, patient moderator, Dr. Dean Dial sir, our senior eminent surgeon and other panelists. Dr. Venkat Ram Reddy sir, Dr. K.R. Nehana sir, Dr. Mohan Reddy sir, <coughs> Dr. G.V.S. Rao sir going to join and Dr. Satya Giran from ENT Hospital, Dr. Manish Ruth and Dr. Navin. So I am handing over this session to Dr. S- our uh, Honorable Pre- President Satish sir to give a welcome now. Sir, so very good evening dear friends and colleagues. At the outset, I welcome Dr. Deen Dayal, who is going to be the moderator of today's panel discussion session, an EMT, an eminent EMT surgeon from Hyderabad and known all over the world. And I also welcome Dr. Mohan Reddy, Dr. G.V.S. Rao, Dr. Venkat Ram Reddy, Dr. Meghna, Dr. Anand Acharya, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Satya Kiran, and Dr. Manushrut, who are the panelists. And I also welcome the guest panelist, Dr. Vishnu Rao, the infectious specialist consultant from Apollo Jubilee Hills, and also Dr. Ashim Morawala, the ocular surgeon, the cosmetic ocular surgeon and oncologist. A warm welcome to all of you, sir, on behalf of AOI for today's panel discussion on nuclear mycosis and the role of ENT surgeon. And as you all know that we are passing through a pandemic which is creating havoc all over the world. We have lost many of our ENT colleagues, many IMA doctors all over Telangana and India. And we have lost so many family members. And when we thought that this pandemic is going to come to an end by at least May or June ending, we have got one more problem and that is mucormycosis. Most of the senior ENT surgeons, they have seen mucormycosis cases now and then, but the junior consultants and the postgraduates have seen mucor, have not seen mucormycosis for the past many years. So, there are so many doubts among the junior colleagues, among the postgraduates, what to do, what not to do, when to interfere, and so many other doubts are there. So, sensing this, AOI has, AOI has come forward to host a panel discussion for the benefit of everybody to improve their skill and knowledge. We have come out with this panel discussion with the help of the panelists and the co-panelists, guest panelists, and Dr. Dean Zemla as the moderator. So, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all the panelists for readily accepting our invitation. And I also thank Dr. Deen Dayal for not only accepting the invitation, but also coming forward to be the moderator of today's session. And I have no doubt that we are going to have a feast of knowledge and many carry home messages. So this particular uh, session, at this particular time, is very important. That is the reason why we have come out with this panel discussion. And as AOI, myself and Dr. Ramesh, we are there for anything for the benefit of the benefit of our colleagues. So as the lockdown and the pandemic we are not able to do, we are not able to work 100% still. 
we are there to work for the association so for we always thank you for your cooperation and with the same cooperation we'll go ahead and see that the oi stands for its name thank you one and all sir and i request dr deendal to take over the mic and start the session thank you very much thank you thank you satesh good evening one and all at the outset i would like to congratulate ay telangana branch especially dr satish dr ramesh and the governing body members to organize this panel discussion on mucor mycosis and the role of an ent surgeon at this crucial time where we are seeing innumerable number of cases of post covid mucor mycosis this talk is going to be of a very great benefit now so slide change ramesh is there somebody who can help with the slide change Asha. Sir, can you use the arrows, sir? Keyboard arrows. Keyboard arrows only I'm using, but particularly. Yes, okay. Oh, yes, I got it. Yes, please. I would, on my behalf and on behalf of AOI Telangana, welcome. my ent colleagues friends dr mohan reddy dr meghnath dr gvs rao dr venkatram reddy dr anand acharya dr b navin dr satya kiran and dr manushrit and of course i thank our guest panelists especially dr vishnu rao who is i have been associated with him for almost 10 years and there have been a lot of difficult cases which we have managed together and he has a tremendous experience in the management of mucor mycosis thank you dr thank vishnu you, for my pleasure sir here. thank you and i also welcome dr aishi morawala and uh, she is young dynamic and she is an ophthalmic plastic orbit and oncological surgeon a product of lb prasad eye hospital at present working in pushpagiri and she has been exposed to a lot of mucor cases in some corporate hospitals where she has been the operating you know faculty welcome dr aishi thank you just to give you an overview of this program we are viewing it to be roughly about 2 to a maximum extend depending on the questions to a two and a half hour panel discussion the main aim is to sensitize all ent surgeons regarding mucor mycosis and its presentation and management i'll take about 7 to 8 minutes to introduce this topic followed by i will first have the panel discussion with dr vishnu which would maximum take between 20 to 30 minutes followed by a panel discussion with dr aishi morawala on the orbital you know involvement and management and that might take around 15 minutes then we ent surgeons would sit down and work out a detailed management in ent starting from early detection investigations anesthesia outcome prevention protection multidisciplinary approach legal aspects and social aspects hopefully we'll be exposed to everything so that you know we have a rough idea as to how we are geared up to take up this epidemic that we are facing all of a sudden so we all know starting with the introduction that covid-19 is associated with a significant incidence of secondary infection of bacterial and fungal it is not just mucor it can be bacterial or fungal and many causes are there like from steroid use to monoclonal antibodies antibiotic use or 
immune dysregulation. So all the above thing has been used as an armamentarium for treating COVID-19. So this is the after effect of it. But in India, if you look at it, the common factor is diabetes. And you will be surprised that Second, please. Anyway, you, you will be observing here that the rhino orbital cerebral infection occurs in about 58% of mucormycosis cases. That means mucormycosis can occur in other sites also, but more than 50% is rhino orbital cerebral. This is a beautiful picture of a magnified picture of mucor, how it looks. And what I want to put forward over here is the family called zygomycetes. That infection is called zygomycosis. That has two subclassification, mucorails and enteromorphotherals. We are looking at mucorails, the infection called as mucormycosis. So please understand under mucorails, you have rhizopus, you have mucor, and many more things like Cunnilinghamilla, Absidia, Rhizomucor P, Saxenia, and others. But if you look, rhizopus and mucor, you know, account for more than 50%. Why I have put these names across is many times the microbiologists in their culture report might give only these names and don't use the word mucor. So don't get confused. All this means mucormycosis. How does this occur? Actually, the mucor has porangiophores. And these porangiophores are present in the environment. It is present everywhere. In our house, around our house, in the dust. Everywhere it is present. And when we are breathing, it goes in through the inhalation and exhalation. But if you're looking at the picture of exhalation, you see somewhere around the middle turbinate, there is an air current. And that is where it starts getting deposited in the middle meatus. And maybe even from there spread to the ethmoid and then to the maxillary sinus. We have to understand this basic concept before we go forward. We should know that our first line of defense is macrophage and macrophages can easily take up spores and the second line of defense is neutrophils and they can eat up the hyphae so you look at the picture of mucor it has a sporangiophores and a hyphae at the bottom so the main things is macrophage and neutrophils and if you see macrophages and neutrophils are required in sufficient quantities to destroy this and the quality and quantity of these form the risk factor for developing mucor. So for a normal person, when he inhales, the chances of he getting is not that easy. It is only an immunocompromised person where the neutrophils and macrophages are affected, mucor starts hitting at them. So if you're looking here in diabetics, macrophages and monocytes fail to sup suppress germination of the spores. And diabetic ketoacidosis is, as is associated with impaired neutrophil function. And altered ion mechanism is another thing that you got to keep in mind, which causes an increase in the unbound serum level in these cases, which is absolutely needed for the mucor organism. <laughs> That's the reason why these cases you are getting mucor mycosis and mucor is not affecting a normal person. So if you're looking at the pathology, there is angio invasion, thrombosis, tissue necrosis, which is the key factor. And angio invasion in mucor is mainly when it affects the endothelial lining of the blood vessel. Another point I want to put across is never come to the conclusion that COVID is the only cause that is caused or diabetes, the only cause for cause of mucor. There are many causes for it. 
But here, I want to mainly highlight one important thing. If you see here, there is prolonged voriconazole prophylaxis causing mycological vacuum in which mucor may emerge. Because we use a lot of voriconazole, especially in our aspergillosis cases, which have been you know, recurrently coming or invasive aspergillosis. And this voriconazole, if it has been used for months together, can at this stage cause a mycological vacuum and you will get a super added mucor. This is something that you have to keep in mind. All other things are very much, you know, the regular ones. This particular paper that was presented talked in terms that if you see, mostly males are affected. And the age group is between 46 and 61. 94% are diabetics. Most of them have uncontrolled diabetes and very commonly seen in severe cases of COVID, post-COVID, not in mild cases. And all of them, at least 88% of them, give a history of use of systemic steroids. If you're looking at the type of presentation of mucor, you will see the commonest is rhino orbital. Please see that, 41%. Whereas rhino orbito cerebral is 27%. And whereas just cerebral is very less and sinus alone is only 8%. Pneumonia is 7 and in the others, we are typically seeing cutaneous type of mucor which is coming in along with the rhino orbito cerebral type of mucor mycosis in our cases. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. So when you're looking at a high risk of COVID patients for mucor mycosis, this is something we have to keep in mind when we are talking about early diagnosis. Wherever there is a history of high dose of steroids, uncontrolled diabetes, prolonged broad spectrum antibiotic use, and tocilizumab use, you keep this in mind. And a simple test which talks about neutropenia, lymphopenia, and blood tests for IL-6 and ferritin will tell you that these are high-risk cases. So maybe as a standard, if we ask for this test, we will get an idea what are the cases that we can pick up at a very early stage. These high-risk COVID-19 patients require frequent follow-up after post-COVID treatment by ENT surgeon periodically to rule out mucor. So my point here is for all the physicians, especially to like Dr. Vishnu, wherever there is a high risk patient, it is better that an ENT examination is a must and endoscopic view because we know mucor is equal to COVID plus steroids plus diabetes. Can I ask Dr. Vishnu to come online? Yes, sir. Yes. Vishnu, you're online? Yes, sir, I'm, I'm here. Wonderful, Vishnu. Thank you, Vishnu, again for coming in. Thank you, sir. And Vishnu, starting off quickly with amphotericin B, we know yes, that this is the first line of treatment. Yes. Sir. I would like us ENT surgeons to, like, you know, view in terms of amphotericin and other things as uh, the word called dummy. I will call myself dummy. So you need to really be a little more informative to us and tell us a little more about liposomal, amphotericin, lipid complex, or colloid dispersion and where and how we need to use. Yes, sir. So I'll make it simple, sir. Uh, try to, uh, you know, uh... Uh, make it in a simpler way. How do we use and, uh, you know, uh, where do we use and what are the side effects and uh, how to infuse and what mm -hmm. are the things we need to look for when we infuse these particular drugs. Uh, so always we prefer, uh, you know, uh, liposomal amphotericin B, but however, in India, we have a lot of the times it's economical issues are always a key, uh, key problem for us, but still uh, plain amphotericin B is also fair enough. But when I'll start with the liposomal uh, plain amphotericin B first, the plain amphotericin B, the normal dosage what we give is from 0.7 mg per kg to 1.5 mg per kg. So around somewhere between 50 to 100 mg in majority of the cases we give. And the dosage uh, per day is around 50 to 100 based on the weight we give. And most important thing is whenever we infuse amphotericin B, we should mix in the dextrose 
five percent dextrose is what we should mix in. We should not mix in NS because this this can interact with the NS and form crystals. So that's the reason. First thing is to infuse. We should infuse in the plain five percent dextrose. When we use this conventional amphotericin B, we typically, you know, for one mg it should be ten ml. For example, if I am taking fifty mg of conventional amphotericin B per day. I have to mix in the 500 ml 5% dextrose, and the infusion should be over four to six hours. So this is typically how we give conventional amphotericin B. We take 50 mg, mix in 500 ml 5% dextrose, infuse over six hours. And the most important thing is uh, because currently you know a lot of hospitals we are not admitting and we are discharging early. What one of the problems what we face is the infusion related side effects. Whenever we give amphotericin B, people can get chills, people can get rigors. Uh, if it is severe enough, they may get some sort of pulmonary uh, bronchospasm or pulmonary edema. These are extreme forms, but majority people will have infusion-related side effects. To prevent that, what we do is we try to give a pre-medication with paracetamol and uh, we give paracetamol and evil injection in very few cases. Uh, in view of very few cases, 10 to 25 dose of NG of hydrocortisone. We try not to give much of hydrocortisone because already we are dealing with mucor. We don't want to give steroids. So yeah. these are the two things we give if somebody has infusion-related events. That is paracetamol and an evil injection. And this is the infusion-related. When it comes to the toxicity, each and every patient who receives amphotericin B, they will major majority of them will have nephrotoxicity and electrolyte imbalance as a side effect. So majority of the people will have raised creatine, number one, and majority of the people will have hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So to reduce nephrotoxicity, the protocol is we give 500 ml NS over one hour before the amphotericin B infusion. We give 500 ml NS after amphotericin B infusion. Remember, we mix in dextrose, but pre -made, we give 500 ml NS before and after to reduce the nephrotoxicity. And once we start down the treatment, every second or third day, we check the creatinine, potassium, and magnesium and correct them appropriately because every majority of the people, they will have some sort of hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia, which we need to address. What we routinely do is we do in real practice, we right from the day of amphotericin B, we prophylax them with uh, potratum or any syrup which contains both potassium and magnesium and we regularly follow up because invariably everyone will have it. So this is about conventional amphotericin B. Now the point is, next is the liposomal amphotericin B. See, we need to understand that liposomal amphotericin B and conventional amphotericin B, if we look into the efficacy wise, we don't have any trial to say that one is superior over the other. It's only that liposomal amphotericin B has less side effects compared to the conventional amphotericin B. Still liposomal amphotericin B can cause side effects. The same thing, it can cause nephrotoxicity. It can also cause the hypokalemia. It can also cause hypomagnesemia. But you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the amount of side effects is less. The, the principles are almost the same. In liposomal amphotericin B, it is be simple. We give 5 mg per kg. And here the mixing is simple. Say if I'm giving 5 mg per kg, it's a 50 mg. If the 50 kg person, 250 mg, you should mix in the same amount ml of dextrose. For example, I'm giving 250 mg, I have to mix in 250 ml of dextrose. If I'm giving 300 mg, mix in 300 ml of dextrose. And we give it over two to four hours. This can be given as early as two to four hours. And the same protocol, whatever I told, holds true for liposomal amphotericin B. In terms of efficacy, we don't have a superiority to say that liposomal is better over conventional. But whenever the patient is affordable, when the drug is available, we prefer liposomal only. The only reason is the cost. So these are the two things we majority of the time we use. And the third one is the amphotericin B lipid complex. It is also the dose what we give is a 5 mg per kg. And this is also efficacy wise is similar to the liposomal amphotericin B. And efficacy wise, this is not superior. The only thing is that the infusion related side effects compared to the liposomal amphotericin B is little lower. That is the only advantage. Probably if you have somebody who has lot of infusion side effects with liposomal amphotericin B, you may have a benefit by using amphotericin B lipid complex. So these are the three things what we regularly use it. Yeah. And uh, in terms of central nervous system involvement, do you think that amphotericin B lipid complex might be helpful apart from liposomal? Uh, sir, sir, in terms of if we compare the efficacy, Though the lipid complex has theoretically has a better penetration into the lungs, liver and spleen. Theoretically, we don't have any advantage of using one over the other because efficacy was both are same. 
though theoretically it appears that lipid complex has probably a little better penetration but that really we don't have an evidence to translate into the clinical success outcomes but so for all practical purposes both are equally efficacious another point vishnu the full dose has to be started right from first day there is nothing like a gradual increase isn't it yes sir yes sir this is one important point sir normally the liposomal amphobi what we give is a 5 mg per kg but we can go up to 10 mg per kg there are three indications one is if the patient has cerebral involvement number one mm. number two when we use in solid organ transplant patients number three when we treat for a disseminated mucormycosis these oh. are the patients where we can use 10 mg per kg but that uh, we have used in only one or two patients are one of the most important is the cost 10 mg per kg is huge and the toxicities we have used with success in a patient with disseminated mucormycosis involving the lung and other areas where debridement was not possible with success rate we have used in one patient 10 mg per kg but these are the three indications where we can use 10 mg per kg i have lost my presentation uh, we also lost sir uh some somebody who's mainly managing the whole thing i lost the presentation asha uh, has lost ha asha are you there yes sir so can you uh, yeah reshare sir uh, you want me to share it okay one minute please has it come no now have you got it no sir no sir no I'm sorry. I don't know. Sir, all you have to log out and re-log in, sir. That is. You want me to log out and log in? Re-log in, sir. Yes, please. I'll do that. Excuse me, a minute, please. minimal can i ask a question to dr vishnu yes sir please so uh, in terms of efficacy uh, 50 mg of conventional is equal to how many mg of uh, liposomal amphetamine sir both actually are... yes sir both are uh, actually sir we don't have any that sort of convergence and unfortunately we don't have uh, anything to say that 50 is equal to 150 or not but at least we have we don't have any evidence to say that liposomal is superior to conventional for all practical purpose both are equal in terms of efficacy the only thing is the benefit is only in terms of the side effects we don't have any convergence to say it is 50 is equal to 150 sir the dose whatever is separate for this one and this one 0.7 to 1.5 yeah but efficacy sir, is still the same in your experience what is your observation sir my observation sir still conventional is fair enough because uh, majority of the times we don't use liposomal because lot of people are not affordable 
uh, still if the patient gets a good debridement if the patient surgic uh, for all for all mucus the first thing is no matter how much i pump if the patient did not get a proper debridement no matter what i do patient will no, come out yeah. If the patient gets a good debridement, plain amphotericin B is fair enough, provided we monitor the side effects and manage them, they do equally well. Sir, uh, uh, what is the cumulative dose you recommend? Sir, actually, sir, uh, uh, cumulative dose, this concept of uh, before cumulative dose in conventional amphotericin B has not been given prior, sir. Uh, but uh, we yeah. don't go for a cumulative dose, sir. But uh, what we typically do you in our center is, sir, whenever a patient has, think, for example, I mean, sorry. Yeah, please, please complete the... Yes, sir. Uh, so yeah. what we generally give, sir, when somebody has mucor, after debridement, we give anywhere ranging between the two to two weeks to six weeks of IV amphotericin B and then step down to the posaconosol. Uh, so based on the extent or the severity of the disease, say if it is a plain sinus disease and it is an early disease, if the debridement has been done very, I mean, if the debridement is, uh, my ENT surgeon is very satisfactory with the debridement, it's only the early disease, I may stop as early as two to three weeks. If the disease is, uh, extensive involving even the I, I go up to six weeks of IV amphotericin B and every week visually inspect the sinus discuss with the ENT surgeon and then after that I'll stop at four to six weeks then step down to the posaconosol and the treatment is still complete clinical and radiological resolution so which may range from as early as uh, uh, six weeks to three months or six months based on the severity. Yeah I think you, you used a word uh, clinical and endoscopic I think clinical yes, and endoscopic vis vision uh, visibility of the nose and sinuses is more important than the radiological investigations. Yes, yes. Sir. Sometimes yes. the post-operative changes and the disease per se will give a similar appearance, may be confusing. Yes, sir. Every week, generally, our one of the protocol is that they'll come every week and uh, you know come to the ENT surgeon, visually inspect, and we discuss with them, and the decisions will be yes. taken, sir. Yes, yes. Sir. visual inspection is more important. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, Sam. Uh, Meanwhile, I started uh, raising some questions. Sam, you are not audible. You have to unmute your mic. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes, can sir. hear you, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. So I think one Vishnu has already explained about how to dilute the thing because that is one important thing. There's one important question here. What is the minimum number of days where we have to use this amphotericin B before we can change over to the oral medication? Sir, uh, we don't have any recommendation like that, sir, but at least two weeks based on the extent of involvement or the none of the recommendation says like you have to use this many days. It's based on the extent of involvement and the severity of the disease. At least two weeks is what we definitely give IV, sir. And then somewhere ranging between the two weeks to six weeks based on the severity is what we give IV followed by oral, uh, followed by the oral uh, uh, transformation. But currently we are, you know, we are, uh, we don't have drugs and very, very limitation of the drugs. So we are tr trying to, you know, get the debridement as, get as, as good as possible and switching, you know, whatever the, how many ever while the patient gets it, we are giving and shifting to oral. But unfortunately that is, that is how the current scenario is. But at least two weeks is what I would say, sir. My, this thing is not moving. Um, now, in terms, I think you have already told about how to go about precautions and other things. What, what I wanted to know is, once a patient is diagnosed as mucor mycosis, you need to start the treatment immediately? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The thought of because uh, uh, once the thought of mucor comes to the mind, first thing is we should start the treatment and, you know, get the imaging or the, you know, involve the surgeon and all has to be done parallelly. So if I have a thought that mucor, okay, tomorrow I will do the imaging, tomorrow, day after tomorrow I'll do that kind of approach we don't recommend because uh, one of the uh, one of the, the delay delay in initiation of amphotericin B is associated with increased mortality in mucor. The moment exactly. the thought process comes, I'm going to start and do parallelly the other things. What investigations do I need to do before I start amphotericin B? Sir, before starting amphotericin B, we regularly check for our serum creatinine because I, we want to make sure that the kidney function test is normal and the baseline electrolytes and the baseline renal function test, we start and then we monitor every 48 to 72 hours to look for hyperkalemia, hypomagnesemia and rise in creatinine. Yeah. These are the three things we look for regularly. Then the next question is, this treatment has to be only started after hospitalization, cannot be treated when the patient is at home. 
Yes, sir. Because a lot of first dose, we always want to give in a hospital because one of the problem with amphotericin is a lot of infusion related side effects. Uh, you know, and a lot of people, you know, we have to give the infusions over four to six hours and a lot of the uh, regular centers or the normal areas, they won't be con uh, uh, confident enough to give those injections. So always we try to give the first, second or third doses here in the hospital. Once the patient gets better, then we'll arrange as an OPAT in the in the home care, home care people will take care. But initially we always want to give to make sure that they don't have any infusion related side effects. If they develop, we have to, uh, you know, at times those infusion related can be life threatening. So we always want the first doses uh, in the hospital under the supervision. Now, there's another interesting question. Do we have to start amphotericin and take the patient up for surgery or you can operate and then later on start amphotericin after two days, three days or four days with this shortage of amphotericin B today? Sir, uh, currently what we are doing is the moment the thought process of mucor comes, whatever medicine there we are giving, I mean either amphotericin B or posaconazole or isovaconazole. Ideally, we should have given amphotericin B, but currently the drug is not available. So give whatever is available. Give that drug and, you know, get, get, uh, go ahead with the surgery. Uh, none is available. Now, none is available. Patient is willing for surgery. Maybe you will get the drug in two days to four days time. Can we take this patient yes, up for yes, surgery? Sir. Yes, sir. Because in fact, a lot of people speak about medications, but it's the debridement that saves the life in majority of the cases rather than the amphotericin B. Thank you. I Vishy. would say it is an add-on, not a substitute. Thank you, given. Thank you. Now comes the most, the new routes of administration is what I wanted to discuss. They're talking about lipolyzed amphotericin B in a nebulized format for the first one to five days along with systemic for some excellent results. What is your opinion on that? Sir, we used to give this nebulized, uh, you know, amphotericin B for lung transplant patients. One of the indication where we give nebulized amphotericin B is lung transplant patients where they have this anastomotic site invasive fungal infections. Because when we give this lung transplant, the inhalation dot directly goes into the lung. This is for this set of category, especially lung transplants. These are the patients where we give as a prophylaxis. But there is no evidence to use this as an inhalation therapy uh, for you know uh, for a sinus infection or the rhin or the sinusitis forms. We don't have enough evidence, and uh, a majority of the time we get away with the de debridement and the IV uh, giving inhalational. As of now, we don't have enough evidence to go for the inhalation forms, and we really don't know how much will it really work. Literature talks about. Patients with neutropenia who develop rhino orbito cerebral type of mucor always have a chance of having a concomitant pulmonary type of a mucor also. Yes, so sir. these type of cases wherein it's in a little advanced stage, maybe nebulization also we can keep in mind? Uh, sir, the problem is that it's not backed up by the evidence here. The nebulization, okay. the evidence is backed up for prophylaxis. Prophylaxis not but not as a treatment aspects especially neutropenics or the lung transplant settings. Even in the lung transplant, even in the uh, prophylaxis also, sir, they give weekly thrice amphotericin B or these are the things, but as such, inhalational alone um, uh, for prophylaxis in certain cases, not for the treatment aspects. What about topical? After sir, surgery? Yes, sir, topical, uh, 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 sir, uh, my experience is that, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if you speak about the data, the data is not robust on that. But when you say ask about the practical experience, I have good experience of using topical in the wound mucus. We used to spill that over the wound. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and uh, some of, I always speak with this way about my uh, uh, ophthal colleagues, probably the other ophthal surgeon can uh, help us. Where when somebody has orbital apex disease, where the debridement is not possible, there's a good number of people who are giving intraorbital uh, amphotericin B with a decent results. But data, it's not like, not huge data based on the individual experiences, case series, it can still work. Right. Intralesional, intrathecal? Intrathecal, we hardly, sir. Intrathecal, we can theoretically give, but once the patient has goes into the meninges, into the brain, by then the prognosis itself is poor. Uh, we don't want uh, muca to enter the meninges and meningitis and into the uh, brain. Once it enters there, the prognosis is poor. And uh, and generally, we at least as of now, you can theoretically give liposomal amphotericin B uh, into the, into the intrathecal. Um, but uh, my experience as of now, I did not give majority of the times goes into the brain rather than the meninges, but theoretically, yes, we can give it. And right. of course, data is case by case. We don't have any uh, robust data to support any of this. So you're given amphotericin B patient has developed certain like raised serum creatinine and certain other side effects, and you're given stopped amphotericin B at that time. Do you start posaconazole or you just wait? 
Uh, sir, uh, generally, you know, majority of the people, the creatinine in viral rise, a, a, a milder elevation, I'll still continue, but if the elevation is more, uh, you know, I'll stop the therapy, but I'll try to wait again and reintroduce the medicine. But say, right. if I get a clinical feel that, no, this patient with kidney cervix, he may not tolerate, I will upfront along with that, I'll give amphotericin B and try to give as much amphot B as possible. And if still is not tolerating, I'm going to stop it and continue the posaconazole or the isoconazole. Right. Is there any cutoff for your serum creatinine where you uh, start? The rate at which it increases, sir. Uh, for example, say if patient creatinine is 1 and tomorrow it suddenly went to 1, 2.5, then I'll be stopping immediately. If it's 1.2, 1.2, like 1.4, I'll still wait. Because saving the life and it's it's always the balance between the kidneys and the you know invasion and life. So it's a, uh, it's it's not with the numbers, but it's with the rate at which it rises, the pre patient prior comorbidities, patient already has a kidney issues, diabetic, his kidneys are friable, then probably I'll have my cutoff lower. Even young patient, I'll try to give as much as I can. Here, there's another interesting question. We know that posaconazole plasma levels are reached to the optimal level only around the seventh day. Yes, sir. Yes. Can't we, you know, add it up along with amphotericin B and then gradually, you know, you pull out amphotericin because when you know that you know, you're able to really maintain the levels. Uh, sir, actually, sir, previously we used to do the same thing, sir. Generally, you know, we used to give somewhere between three to four weeks of amphotericin B. And once we plan to stop one week before, we used to overlap. Because yes. at that time, the syrup used to be there, sir. The problem with the syrup is the attainment of the therapeutic levels. It takes at least seven days. Ah. So that's the reason we used to overlap that last seven days. But now with the advent of tablets and, you know, with the shortage of tablets. So we are not doing that. But ideally, that has to be done. But, you I, know, it's all the practical. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So you talk anything about preventive posaconazole where you are suspecting cases that you might go into with all these, you know, conditions like patient on ventilators and with immunosuppressants and others. Do you give preventive posaconazole? Actually, no, sir. I, I, I'm glad that you brought up this question. A lot of people are discussing about giving posaconazole prophylaxis and which I completely do not agree, sir, because when I have a problem, I need to address the underlying cause. You know, giving medicine, it's, you know, everybody feels that, okay, we'll give this medicine, Chalo, we'll give this medicine. But that is going to cause unnecessary abuse of the drugs rather than the addressing the underlying risk thing. The addressing issue is the excessive use of steroids, which has to be under control and very good management of the diabetes. These are the two factors which has to be controlled because, for example, in our team, when we have when we have a COVID patient, we involve a special uh, diabetes, for example, endocrinologist was this one. And uh, we make sure that the sugars are controlled. And our recommendations also, we don't go very high on the steroids. So restrict steroid usage, control sugars. And with that, our mucor rates are very, very less. So if I start prophylaxing everybody diabetes, then I have to give thousand of my patients to prevent one mucor. So that the toxicity okay. and the cost with the drug is far high compared to the benefit is going to offer. And sir, the other thing is that a lot of people are under the impression that medicine will prevent. Let me tell you, if the underlying risk factor is not being addressed, still people can get new curves, though I put on more posaconazole. And that is very, very proven by the fact that we have this bone marrow transplant who has whose disease is bad, they have prolonged neutropenia. No matter we keep them on amphobia, no matter keep them on posaconazole, if that underlying risk factor is not addressed, the medication what we give still do not work. So prophylaxis in an exceptionally rare cases after discussing with the team is something we need to consider, but not on a routine basis. Dose is 300 mgbd, or is there anything else that you would like? Ah, uh, sir, if it is uh, if it is uh, IV or oral, it is 300 bd on day one, followed by 300 od. The tablets are available as 100 mg. We need to give three tablets. Got it. And a little about isoviconazole. Sir. See, we know that it is approved in 2015, and that this is another thing that is used in terms of is it used as a first line of treatment? If a patient has a choice between Ampho B and isoviconazole, do the action be the same at both or you still say Ampho B is the first one? Yes, sir. I think uh, it's still Amphotericin B is the drug of choice. There is no drug which is proven superior to Amphotericin B. The alternatives are posaconazole slash isoconazole. None of these drugs are superior over Amphotericin B. I may prefer these two drugs over amphotericin B only if I have toxicity related issues where my patient has borderline kidneys, my patient may fail the therapy or is getting a lot of side effects, then only I will use this. The other indication is as a step down therapy, once I give good dosage of amphotericin B as a step down, not as an upfront substitute 
for amphotericin b so it's mainly because of its advantages is what that you are looking at it yes sir it's, it. efficacy wise that is the best yeah the combination therapy with fungals with echinocardins or dexferoxys ross do you think uh, you do use it now with this uh, rhino cerebral uh, you know ocular mucor when it comes to the uh, echinocardin sir there is some retrospective data to say that if it is a rhizopus species causing uh, you know a sino orbital mucor mm. adding caspofungin to the amphotericin may help but it is not a robust data and it's not like a wonder drug where we had the patient gets better no it is based on a very few case series uh, still I, i i generally don't use it still i stand with good debridement and amphotericin b plain alone and coming One. to this, yes sir and coming mm. to this desferox desferox sir this is also based on very case very few case reports in fact the Euro, it is only few case experiences from few of the case series it is also not a wonder drug or anything and in fact uh, in fact the uh, uh, european recommendations say against its usages uh so we generally don't use it and it's not going to help much a quick thing about hyperbaric oxygen we have few hyperbaric oxygen centers in hyderabad do you think they can be of any help so data is not uh, very good sir for moon mucus lot of i have seen lot of uh, other uh, you know uh, sir colleagues using this um mm. but uh, i personally feel that you know the benefit is not really very good it's ultimately it nails down to the good debridement and amphotericin be followed by posar this is what ultimately uh, does the magic i feel none of else none, nothing else works this is my personal take on this would be a very important part isn't it reversal of underlying host impairment yes sir yes management of the sugars is the most important underlying risk factors is the key without that giving any medicine or any drug or any surgery won't help the patient what about granulocyte transfusion do you think in neutropenia it would help save the patient uh, yes sir in few of the neutropenic patients one of the problem is that you know uh, in a post transplant setting or a post hemopoietic transplant setting uh, because of few reasons that uh, duration of neutropenia may prolong and in fact along with the drugs we require neutrophils to function so it is used as an adjunct uh, uh, to the amphotericin b till the neutrophils are recovered uh, you know it's a case by case discussion not everybody gets it but somebody who is a high risk patient who takes long time for the neutrophils to recover who is already in the amphotericin b adding this can help but uh, it is only in a few selected cases not for everybody sir a quick word about methylen blue what do you think no sir uh, i am completely this is against the data there is no data for that and uh, in fact i'll tell my experience there is one patient who has been given this methylene blue and i he had come with all sort of neuro neurotoxicity he had methemoglobinemia he has neurotoxicity uh, in fact and un- un- uh, ultimately the patient did not do well succumbed because of the aspiration pneumonia because of he had the poor uh, alter mental status because of this particular drug given outside and so thank, you. thank you thank you that has been really wonderful that is a very very good take home message for all because people are all picking up a lot of ampules of methylene blue and that is something that we need to keep in mind what about these newer drugs is there anything in the market especially enconcleated amphotericin b oral preparation no sir, this uh, currently sir this is in the st- these are in the studying phase sir are uh, this risa fungus oral of him these are all the new antifungals which has a uh, uh, good action against the candida and certain species of aspergillus few of the mucus but still they are confined to the in vitro we don't have still robust data available and uh, we are very well waiting for that uh, we don't have a good clinical trial to say the efficacy of this still it's is the time that decides so vishnu i've got about eight questions like yeah, a, the fastest finger quick answers that would give a lot of information for us and that is something i would want it's like you know what is your opinion is the cause of this increased mucor cases in the second wave when compared to first wave sir actually first wave also we had mucor sir in fact we had almost uh, i happen to say 30 or 40 mucors but the second wave what happened i believe is sir because of the absence of availability of beds because of the absence of availability of drugs lot of people have become doctors have become desperate i mean it's a, it's a with a good intention because sir till recently we don't have beds for any of our patients so even with the slightest say we used to wait and rather than the wait and watch policy lot of people have resumed to give steroids in an outpatient patient even though it is not required just because of the fear that you know if this patient require hospitalization he will die because there are no beds no oxygen available this is the trend that happened throughout the country all these days probably that is one of the reason where there was lot of over usage of steroids you know that has caused 
And so I, th- yes, sir. Second question: Unqualified personnel treating COVID-19 in the second wave, where they did not really control the usage of steroid. What do you yes, think? Sir. Yes, sir. That definitely adds to the picture. Yes, I 100% agree with you, sir. Because even I had a lot of patients who had taken steroids by themselves. Exactly. Without, exactly. without even telling the doctor. One patient got exposed to COVID. Yes, sir. Yes. That is no. definitely, sir. Without ENT exam or debridement, medical treatment of mucor cases. What is the end result? Patient will die. Exactly. So this is something I want to put forward. Many cases are admitted in the government hospital in the medical wards for being treated. I mean, I'm making a statement in the medical wards under treatment. So this is the take home message. If you don't operate, patient will die, even if you give the medical treatment. During this pandemic with increase in cases of mucor, Without the facility for multidisciplinary management, can an ENT surgeon start medical treatment and follow up with the type of advice you are giving online? Can we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because ultimately, I believe it's the surgery. Without surgery, no matter what I do, patient won't get better. So ENT surgeon is the one who does the surgery. Yes, you can do the surgery, sir. And you know, always you can you know take the help of other colleagues for the medical management of the side effects. Yes, sir. Who should be the primary physician? Primary physician, yes, I would say multidisciplinary, sir. Uh, ENT physician, because even in the follow-up, a regular visual inspection is required. So ENT should be on board, and along with that, you know, uh, uh, physician is what I would say, sir. I would say who has to be the primary physician? Of course, ENT. Sir. <laughs> is it is it a physician? Is it a ENT surgeon, or is it an ophthalmic surgeon, especially when it is rhino orbital involvement? I would say it's a tough question you asked. I would say multidisciplinary. Everybody has their role, but I personally believe that first I, patient should come to ENT physician because visual inspection of sinus is something I want that that has to be done every week. So when it comes and you can always discuss with the physician when it comes to the dosage and all. It's a multidisciplinary. I can't give so one I over feel, the other. I feel yeah. the primary physician has to be a physician or an infectious diseases specialist. The job exactly. of the ENT surgeon is over after he operates. The yes. rest of the follow-up for six to eight months, whatever yes. treatment is that of the person who is a physician. Then Glad last that you said, sir, sir, I can't say on an ENT forum to send the case. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I'll just write here. Sir, sir, ENT surgeon has a very important role to monitor the disease, sir. Sir, physician yes. Yes, sir. cannot monitor the disease. Only uh, unless he is trained in the nasal endoscopy. So I think, uh, uh, and another thing, sir, ENT surgeon can diagnose the disease in the early stage than a physician. I am with you on that. I am with you on that. Only Meghnath, I am only saying the minute the primary physician word comes, the onus falls on them. We can take responsibility of our surgery, but we can't take responsibility of side effects of the injections. And the follow-up for three to six months, we are all the time operating. So and also, the and also the patients will have multiple morbidities. Exactly. Yes, Mohan. The patient is the one hmm. who has to follow after the surgery is done, and the physician always has to get opinion from the ENT surgeon. Yes. With the endoscopy yes. picture. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. In fact, we have we formed a team, sir. This is what we are doing currently, sir. We are forming the teams now. The physician who should take the case after the yes. surgery. He should be the under figure under the physician. Yes, sir. Currently, we formed a team, sir. One ID physician, uh, one uh, ophthalmic surgeon, and one ENT and the micro. As a team, we are doing it and forming a forming a common group and also head and neck surgeons. And so, as a team, when the patient comes to the ID, then we'll send him to the ENT. Then that's how the patient comes, and that's how the follow-up happens here. As a team, we form, the and this is how we are trying to manage. You. The patient will yes, continue sir. under you. First, they come to us, but that's what, sir. I feel that it's not one person, sir. Like everything has its own importance. I can't say that you know I am good or like somebody else. It's a it's so a day to day team that if, takes. If, that if takes the day to day if the day to day complaints comes and he calls me and I don't answer, even if I know. Even if I know, I can read the subject, but it is a physician who has got much, much more knowledge yes. about the entire body system. Yes, sir. Ma, Vishnu, I have the I last question. The question. Yes. I have the last question before I let you go. Sir. This is, 
what is the precaution to be taken if at all there is a possibility of a third wave which people are predicting sometime in the month of october to prevent mucor what would be your take home for the precaution part of it sir first thing is i think is a very good question you have asked sir um, first thing is unfortunately uh, uh, the best what what have what we have to do protect from covid unfortunately when we got vaccines for, for free when the government gave it for free there are a lot of doctors who did not take the vaccine in fact those people who been vaccinated after second dose after those those doctors who got after second dose two weeks of second dose of vaccine the apollo data says it's 0.6% is the mortality rate and all those deaths which obtained in the doctors majority of them it is because of the lack of vaccine i'm not saying vaccine vaccine is still helping in majority of our patients so vaccinate 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 number 1 Number two, for all the doctors, like now that we are seeing so many mucus, we need to have an understanding. We need, we should know that why it is getting the simple usage. I've seen lot of people being pumping pulse dose methyl prednisolone for lot of mucus. That sort of practice has to be avoided. And all the patients on mucus mycosis, their sugars has to be parallelly managed. And if pro, if possible, uh, endocrinologist or a separate person has to be allotted for the management where the uh, where where there is a facility. And in fact, that is what we do. Wonderful. and uh, in terms of stopping medication do you empirically stop after 6 months or do you really do a radiological culture biopsy and get a negative and then stop the medicine yes sir yes. Com- till complete clinical clinical and radiological radiological resolution at times as meghna sir was telling it is going to take some time it's ultimately it is a clinical and if required out a biopsy of the sinus and making sure that the disease is not there and then we going to stop sir ultimately before i stop i speak to my ent surgeon i'll call i'll discuss i'll speak how is the mucosa inside and i'll call my ophthalmologist surgeon how what do you think the disease when the ent uh, convinces or when the ophthalmologist convinces when i am also convinced then i'm going to stop the treatment that is what the recommendation says still complete clinical and radiological resolution the drugs should be stopped there is no optimal duration on how long to give thank you this is the role of the sir thank you one question to vishnu shall i ask yes sir please go ahead mohan yeah vishnu radiological picture also is equally important because as uh, we know that you know the scarring and all no? the scarring also over what we see in the endoscope sometimes obstructs the deep seated disease the deep seated disease we can find pick up with the radiological pictures okay. okay particularly when it goes deep into the orbits or intracranial part and all those areas the second thing you say that up to 45 days no the treatment with antifungal maximum maximum loading yes, dose yeah. is there any limit suppose the, the patient of the disease recurrence so patient comes with cerebral or deep seated where it is not Uh, it could not be resected the bones or skull base or so many areas where uh, i mean hidden areas located still the patient may come with a recurrence in your yeah. experience or the literature what is the experience of re i mean uh putting the patient again and again under antibiotic yes sir yes sir uh, in fact we had some cases like that uh, when somebody comes with a recurrence the first thing i you know is the discuss with the whether the debridement is properly done or if there is any deep seated tissue where we could not do the debridement so that is the first plan we decide and we reinstate we reinstate the patient on amphotericin b again and i have given twice or few of the patient twice or thrice also amphotericin b despite good debridement Uh, uh you know we have to reinitiate and we can give sir we can give for long time even after thorough debridement yes sir we can reinitiate if the patient gets again we can we have to reinitiate amphotericin b because that is the best available drug thank you so what, 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 is the, what is the toxicity in such cases like how they end up like sir good thing is that whatever the side effects with amphotericin b majority of them are reversible in the first setting when i used it when the creatinine went up it comes back to normal in majority of the cases when the patient have a recurrence again i'm going to start amphotericin b whatever those acute you know rising creatinine and hyperkalemia or hypomagnesemia they all tend to reverse so that is something uh, you know good about this particular drug sir Holiday of treatment, they will reverse like. Right? Reverse, Dr. yes, Vishnu? yes, sir, yes. Hello, Doctor Vishnu. Sir, please. Uh, there is a reported evidence that uh, amphotericin may be resistant in about twenty percent of the individuals. Sir, uh, especially it, it 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 holds true for certain species of mucor, sir. Majority of the species of mucor they are susceptible to amphotericin B, but there are certain species like Apophysomyces, Saxena, Cunigamella. There are certain species which can be intrinsic, which can be resistant to amphotericin B. 
so but Especially, for that for us to identify that actually it culture has to grow and then we need to pick up and unfortunately we don't have any areas to do culture susceptibilities one more factor it, it has been the experience of many ent surgeons in the second wave that amputation is not working as it was earlier i mean in spite of uh, good debridement sir yes sir and what the, and are you are you are, are you okay with the quality of because sir the reality what happens is when when the drugs are all not available when we are asking patients to get drugs they are come getting from the black market i really don't know what quality it has i uh, it's very difficult the, to comment that sir that may be the factor yeah yes sir i is really the difficult to comment the, yes in the sir. follow up doctor in the follow up sir in the follow up therapy of more than a uh, few weeks or months sir, is the esr and then crp are the markers to uh, assess the patient condition here yes. total relief has occurred angus we, we we don't rely on the csr here sir but for example if it's a skull based osteomyelitis because of pseudomonas these are the things where i can rely along with the clinical and the crp but when it comes to the invasive fungal infections like mucor and aspergillosis lot of the people crp may not be that high and we cannot rely on the crp for us to make decisions it's the visual inspection discussion with my ent and ophthalmic surgeon and myself convincing and then ending the therapy okay shall we shall we say that uh, we to thank vishnu for his wonderful time he has given vishnu thank, thank you, you very much thank you. thank you sir thank you sir my pleasure thank, thank you. you thank you sir bye sir thank, sir. thank, thank you vishnu sir uh, our next part thank you vishnu and shall we all give a nice applause for vishnu please thank you thank you sir very much thank you vishnu thank you bye sir bye we have dr aishi morawala yeah. with us and uh, she is the ophthalmic surgeon so kaishi are you with us yes dr inder i'm here wonderful 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 so here one of the most important uh, questions i wanted to put is whenever there is orbital involvement there has to be a nasal or a sinus involvement do you agree with me or is there just exclusive orbital involvement also no 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 there is not there's always a source that comes from a more external part of the body usually because the orbits are so adjacent to multiple sinuses the root is usually infection or uh, mucor within the sinuses that then percolates through thin walls whether the orbital floor or the medial wall of the orbit into the orbit itself so mainly it is the orbital floor or the medial wall of the orbit between these two i think it is the medial wall of the orbit that is more that susceptible yeah this is and because the medial it. wall actually has a lot of perforations and congenitally many time has defects as compared to the floor which is a lot thicker in most cases so yes medial wall percolation is higher great now coming to the presentation especially here post covid presentation from the ophthalmology point of view what is the combination of cases what you have seen here with this type of symptomatology that is present so the at least the comforting thing is that mucor without the background of covid and mucor with the background of covid presents similarly so at least we are not in a position where we have to figure out new symptoms and signs to delineate a covid base from a patient who is you know covid negative but still has mucor rhinoorbital mucor mycosis usually begins with some kind of sinus headache or focal persistent pain in the eye or in the cheek sometimes it is dental ache and sometimes it is a vague sinus headache type picture the pain is usually the first symptom and this is followed by periorbital or facial swelling which is again slowly progressive so it's mainly the periorbital swelling is where they will think about an eye surgeon exactly and the beauty of our anatomy is that even if the infection originates in the sinuses because of the proximity and the sh shared nerve supply the pain is often radiated to the eye yes Even if there is no active infection in the eye so that's also an important point to know now whenever they complain of a blurred vision is it mostly the pathology is in the sinus and really the vision is not affected or the blurred vision does it give you a sign that there is something else in the eye yes in mucor 
unlike in, in so in bacterial cellulitis, many a times when the patient presents with blurred vision, it can be simply pressure because of swollen tissues on the nerves. But mucor very typically presents without much inflammation in the orbit in a majority of cases. So when you have a quiet orbit where there is blurred vision, then your suspicion of mucor is very high because here it is actually a vessel thrombosis. Whether yeah. it is the central retinal artery or it is the internal carotid itself or the ophthalmic artery, there is a thrombosis within the vessel that has caused direct retinal ischemia. So that oh. is what the majority of like, uh, let's say diplopia would give you an idea that the rectal muscle might be partly involved. And uh, the minute you talk of proptosis, is it something like a rectroocular type of a thing, edema that is pushing it forwards? Yes. So proptosis has to be slightly distinguished from edema of the eyelids. Ah. Proptosis ah. is where structures behind the globe within the orbital walls are pushing the globe. Whereas eyelid edema is something in front of the globe. So when you have proptosis, that is a more dangerous sign as compared to simple eyelid edema. Right. So now if you're looking at the orbit, it has a medial lateral compartment, a superior inferior and a posterior compartment. Now there is pathology in the medial compartment. Have you seen cases where medial compartment is not involved, but inferior and lateral is involved or only inferior and posterior are involved without the medial? Yes, yes, I have. Although you're right in assuming that a majority of cases will have medial extraconal involvement because of the adjacent ethmoids, I have seen quite a few cases in which there is only isolated inferior orbital involvement with inferior rectus inflammation because the majority of the infection is in the adjoining maxillary sinus. See, why I wanted this is I wanted a take-home message that whenever the medial orbital compartment is involved, the pathology is coming from the ethmoid. Yes. But in when the inferior part is involved, it is coming from the maxillary sinus. Yes. yes. That is where you need to look into. And many a time when you deep right the ethmoid in a medial compartment, you would have removed quite a bit of an infection load from there. Yes. Yes. And uh, maybe you would be able to even salvage the eye without any major surgery. Very much. I'm glad you brought this up because uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, of maybe a few months ago, we saw a lot of cases in the late stage. But now of late, and this is again pointing to a lot of public awareness and the ability of physicians now to pick up this disease very early. I have seen a lot of cases recently where there is focal inflammation, whether in the medial orbit or the inferior orbit, that has reduced and almost disappeared after only sinus debridement. Oh, okay. so that's, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Have you in your practice seen cases which have just come in without any periorbital edema or anything, with just loss of vision, especially in this pandemic, I mean, this second yes. wave? Yes, I have. And actually, that is pathognomonic of mucor. That is when your diagnosis of mucor is actually better supported. Without inflammation, sudden, complete loss of vision, and radiological evidence of some sinusitis where oh. the rest of the it may actually be quiet. <laughs> Got it. Now comes the next point here that how many of your cases had apart from orbit a central nervous system involvement, CNS involvement? So I've had about, uh, I would say, three to four cases so far that had either temporal lobe cerebritis or frontal lobe involvement. And most of them, because they had quite a flagrant orbital involvement also, were exenterated. Okay. But an important point to note here is the exenteration was done because the orbit was also quite badly involved. 
if you have only central nervous system or intracerebral foci of infection and the orbit is relatively quiet, then any amount of debridement of the orbit will not change the intracerebral invasion. That's an important uh, point. What is your common investigative mode where you suspect mucor in the orbit, please? Yeah. yeah, so typically we take the help of an MRI scan with contrast mm -hmm. because here we don't want so much the bony delineation, but we need to see the very, very fine soft tissue features. For example, the leading ed edge of the infection or delineation of the apical tissue status. If there is any advancement of infection beyond the apex affecting the cavernous sinus causing its inflammation, or thrombosis within all this is better delineated on an MRI and that too with contrast. So that would be my investigation of choice always. Now here, this is an MRI. You are seeing that the pathology is in the right maxillary sinus, right inferior turbinate going into the medial compartment and a little bit of the inferior part here. So these type of cases, a ENT surgeon can happily open up and deal with it. Yes. And in fact, I would suggest that considering, particularly if you are not able to get an ophthalmologist or an oculoplastic surgeon at hand, removing the anterior or the mid portions of the floor and the medial wall will not pose too much of a threat to vision. The point of time you have to worry about the patient having, you know, worsening of vision or loss of vision is if we are going to go to the apex or the posterior one third of the orbit endoscopically. Part. Right, yeah. right. So it is the posterior ethmoid part where the orbital apex is where you need to worry about it, but anteriorly removing quite a bit of lamina and floor where yes. actually it's the osteomyelitic bone that would definitely help the patient. Yeah. I would just what put about, one more point here. Yeah, please. Uh, mm. Definitely remove all necrotic and osteomyelitic bone but avoid creating new tracts into healthy tissue because once we breach the periorbita, we are creating new ways that the infection can again re-enter from the sinuses into previously uninvolved orbit. But of course, if the bone is uh, myelitic and if you find even pus after opening up the periosteum in that focal region, definitely go ahead and remove. Now, when we see on an MRI that the recti muscle are edematous and big, is there any role for surgery? No. no. Exactly. Now, in this have, particular yes. uh, So, there are a lot of cases recently who have come with isolated ophthalmoplegia. Maybe only the abduction is not full or only the elevation is not full. And in those cases, we find that the rectus muscle is inflamed adjacent to involved sinuses. Sometimes it is only one muscle, sometimes it is two. I have conservatively managed a lot of these patients and they have done well. Is it with the amphotericin? Yes, yes. Right. And uh, I wanted to know another important thing. A patient without proptosis, with only eyelid edema, comes to a real, like a frog-like look. Yes. Uh, maybe one possibility we have to think about is a type of ethmoiditis or even a cavernous sinus also can present like that. In that type of cases, is there something you you differentiate whether a cavernous sinus involvement is there or not? So cavernous sinus involvement will always be a situation where the globe and the retrobulbar portions get affected as well. So in a situation where you only have eyelid edema, but when you try to elevate the eyelids, you see a white globe, which is not pushed out, then that is not likely to be cavernous sinus thrombosis. Because CST causes a big backflow and that causes a dilatation of conjunctival vessels, a very red, angry looking eye in most cases, and even bilateral symptomatology. Oh, bilateral also. Yes. Okay. 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 Now comes the very important point. There are cases where you see the orbit is really filled with mucor, but the vision is maintained. But there is a lot of mucor over there. You can, in your MRI, make out that there is necrotic thing. 
in these cases where the vision is still there, do you still do an accentuation or do you wait? So I have seen so far any patient that has had viable orbit, meaning that the vision is currently unimpaired, I have observed. Necrotic foci I have usually seen in patients who have no vision. Diffuse <laughs> inflammation in the orbit with good vision I have seen and I have treated conservatively with serial MRI scans, sometimes even at 48 to 72 hours. Thank in you. Case, that is a wonderful statement you have put in. This is something that we need to keep in mind that for you to take a decision, you might require serial MRI scans like uh, Aishi has said between even 24 to 48 hours. Okay, that is where you take your call whether you really need to exenterate or not. I think that's a very nice uh, point. And uh, tell me, isolated orbital apex syndromes in mucor, have you yeah. seen? Yes. yes. And uh, do you send them to ENT surgeons to manage or do you manage? No, no. So in mucor, there is never going to be a situation where the ophthalmologist alone will be adequate for treatment. Thank it'll you. It will either be my fabulous ENT colleagues or it will be maybe a neurologist who might have to take the call. I would say an uh, ENT surgeon because orbital apex or sinuses, an ENT surgeon is far superior to a neurologist. Anything also, in the brain, I will give neurologists yeah, the yeah. advantage, but not in the sinuses and the orbital apex and where exactly. the sphenoid is concerned. A lot of my ENT colleagues in cases where we have orbital apex syndrome have actually gone endoscopically and debrided the posterior apex without the need for an exenteration and a disfiguring surgery. So right. your teamwork and team decision making makes a big difference. Any intralesional, uh, you know, amphotoxin B for the eye you have been giving or anything? Yeah. So we've given it in a few cases. It's uh, it's the hot new topic. And because of that, we don't have much, uh, you know, absolute data or absolute indications. A couple of points I would just say is that you use it in early cases. If you have a big necrotic or large abscess in the orbit, your best bet is going to be debridement and not conservative therapy. If you have isolated inflammation in a small portion of the orbit, you can attempt this injection. And usually three to five daily doses is what mm -hmm. you have to give. Watch out for inflammation that follows these injections. And there is a theoretical risk of direct neurotoxicity also. So it's okay. important to take consent. And second infection. OK. The consent for the neurotoxicity part of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you said disease versus, disease versus vision. You would still give vision a priority. Yes. And, and it is only in that situation where the disease might progress and affect the life of the patient is where yeah. you will remove, will remove, do the exenteration. I'll give a small disclaimer here. Usually, I take these decisions because I'm very confident that when required, I will be available to make the decision for the patient. I can go every day and see that patient. I can go every 48 hours and see that patient. Because I'm in a position to follow up closely, I can make these perhaps slightly difficult decisions. Got it. And uh, is there, would you like to classify this orbital excentration into either total or partial? Yeah. Is there any for, such thing or no? Not really, but for, uh, to make it easy for our audience, if there is necrotic eyelid skin, then you have to remove it and you do what is known as a total excentration, after which what remains is an open socket. If as in most cases that I have done, the eyelid skin is intact and only the deeper tissues are affected. You can spare the upper and the lower eyelid skin and suture it over the socket. Oh, okay. so that it's okay. yeah. Sympathetic ophthalmitis, is there a possibility in mucor? No, no. it's a so very simple reason. Yeah, 
because for this you have to have an open globe and you have to have the inner uveal tissue exposed to the outside environment and to the surrounding of it in exenteration we remove the globe in toto without perforating it wonderful so, aishi i think that has been wonderful you have answered most of our questions i thank you very much for giving your time to us and it has been extremely informative shall we all the panelists shall we ask uh, doctor to say thank you or uh, you have a question more on Yeah. Hello. Hello, madam. Uh, orbital, orbital pathology. If the disease is there, necrotic disease, in, especially in the lateral compartment, lateral to the globe, yeah. then then probably you are, you can do better job like in the lateral arbitratomy or something. How you yeah. how you what do you think like how you manage that? Definitely. See, we can, can we can easily encircle up to 280 degrees. Yes. Uh, but yes. still, no lateral to the globe and lateral to the uh, I mean, lateral post to lateral bone spot. Sometimes. If you have a, yeah, if you have an abscess anterior to mid, it is very possible that the vision is okay, but you have this necrotic focus. In that situation, definitely uh, the ophthalmologist or plastic surgeon can go ahead okay. with a laparotomy. a nice conservative one and remove it okay. we just have to understand that there is follow up of such patients is important because i have done conservative measures in a few patients and unless you closely follow up and they continue iv ampho b for a good amount of time they tend to worsen yeah so thank you yeah thank you, thank you. good very point much. about that and Hello? inflammation madam inflammation and uh, necrotic tissue yes. i think that's a very good point one has to keep in mind most of the times this uh, what we see in mri as a some kind of a blurred blurred picture than the compared to the other side yes yeah, then when we see in the uh, i mean operative field still we yes. find it an inflammation only Yes. with the periosteum or uh, periabita being uh, to totally normal sometimes there will be necrosis inside but i think serial mri will help us in that case well, so properly and usually the simple way to understand is that uh, if contrast enhancement is taking place even to some extent okay. yeah. it indicates viability yes necrotic yes. tissue is dark it does Correct. not pick up contrast Yeah, about the uh, prosthesis fitting. When we remove the in inferior wall, most of the inferior wall and medial wall, and uh, when we encircle too much, yeah. too and still is it okay for you? Yes, because this exenteration prosthesis is put very anterior. It is not the same as the glass eye that you put after just globe removal. Here you are removing all the contents, so the prosthesis is actually a stick-on. or a magnetic piece a plastic piece without any mobile eyelids which which so, areas you would you like to be preserved like you know sometimes you know this in the the inferior orbital rim and uh, even the okay. rim gets involved with the axilla okay. and the osteomyelitis and the posterior most part also we have to remove sometimes until the orbital apex which parts the, you feel to be preserved like Yes. So, for the purpose of exenteration fitting, the orbital rim must be intact. But as I would say to any specialist treating this disease, let's not worry about cosmesis at all. Oh yeah, the disease has to go. Has to go. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. shall we? Shall we let Dr. Raishi go? I have a question. Who's Hello? that? Dr. Anand Acharya. Ah, Anand. Anand, please go ahead, Anand. there was a patient with me who complained of eye pain and headache yes. we got the investigations done the total sinuses everything was normal it was reported as fungal mass around the internal carotid artery in the cavernous sinus this is just my experience does the ophthalmologist have a similar type of pictures at any time i haven't seen an isolated case like that yet sir but uh, once it has reached the cavernous sinus then our role would be quite minimal because through external routes we will not be able to come to that area for tissue dissection or removal of the thrombus yeah thank you hello so madam madam 
हेलो हेलो क्वेश्चन फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ मेनी मैडम व्हाट आर योर इंडिकेशंस फॉर ऑर्बिटल एक्सेंट्रेशन पर से वेरी प्रिसाइसली when goes the clinical grounds radiological grounds put together what are your indication for orbital excentration yeah so i had prepared a slide for this very purpose so the first thing the most typical situation in which you will say yes let's do excentration is when you have frank signs of orbital cellulitis you have a proptosed globe no vision and total ophthalmoplegia the second situation is a large necrotic abscess within the globe in the orbit which will again very likely have reduced or absent vision the third situation is fever it has been found that patients who have fever in mucormycosis benefited from early excentration and have improved survival okay. and the fourth is on your serial scans as well as on clinical examination there is rapid progress of the disease right medical management okay yes just one point i have to add is that for medical legal purposes it is always better to perform excentration after either microbiological or histopathological confirmation of the mucus of, of course of course that will be so uh aishi thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Dinhaya. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for giving us the time. And it has been very, very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now so we we'll go to the main uh, uh, part of the discussion. I think now the time is six twenty. We'll try to work out as fast as possible. I think we have the whole lot of uh, the our ENT panelists that are very much there. and we'll quickly start off i want to quickly start off my question what i mean is that i have a lot of questions but if my panelists can answer to the point then we can ask more questions and many people will benefit from it so only viewing is question answer question answer would be a very much it will be a better thing like for example these are all the clinical features that are there like you know you're talking of a sinus tenderness the maxillary sinus is involved like i want to know in the presentation that is coming in the second wave what is that group of initial symptoms with which the patients are coming to us we'll quickly work out dr mohan yeah i think this time what we are seeing is the acute symptoms like facial pains and blurred vision and nasal discharge the nasal discharge post nasal sometimes blood stain and the pain yes dr megnath patients will yeah I, symptoms I, i agree with uh, dr mohan reddy uh, the pain is the first and foremost symptom uh, in this uh, pandemic of uh, right orbital mucor dr venkat ram reddy yes sir pain pain is pain, the, pain is the thing dr ramnath ipsilateral ipsilateral pain cheek swelling sir any sort of pain to the chain ipsilateral pain to be kept in mind dr anand pain and cheek swelling and even a minimal swelling just below the eye either right or left i'll be alarmed dr b navin dr satyakiran yeah yes sir uh as seen nearly 34 patients out of which 22 patients complained of cheek pain that is unilateral and uh, orbital swelling and pain in 14 patients so it's mainly the cheek pain is the chief complaint pain and orbital swelling complaint we should not overlook all other things are second and dr manushrut do you also agree okay now we go to the quickly the next one see what we are looking at here is the advanced clinical features we know patient is coming but i want to know quickly what percentage of your cases are coming with orbital symptoms dr mohan yeah i think um, of uh, now of late with the awareness we are finding early symptoms otherwise no in the initial cases it's almost uh, 60% as uh, also like that now it's about about a, 
uh, even advanced symptoms, uh, percentage is becoming less and less with the more and more awareness, media and all. No? Everybody is running, even coming without... Early. Coming, coming early. early. Coming right. early, yes. Dr. Devious Rob, you are there? Okay, Dr. Meghnath, what do you think is your percentage in terms of advanced? The periorbital swelling and uh, numbness, proptosis are around 25%. The blood vision is around 10 to 15%. Surprisingly, I have not seen uh, uh, more than two patients who complained of diplopia. Uh, but on examination, 10% will have the diplopia. Okay. Uh, the loss of vision in the affected is around 10%. Uh, Anand, what about you? Sir, so just a minute. the painful black ulceration of the heart palate is a quite a common symptom. Uh, the 40% of my patients are having ulceration of the heart palate. That's a nice point because you're talking of 40% of the cases. Yes, sir. 40% is a very high number and we know that when it is heart palate, that means the maxillary sinus is involved. Involved and ultimately maxillary is to be done. Yes, yes, that is the thing. What about you, Anand? 50% it is the chemosis, another 50-60% when there is chemosis there is loss of vision, loss of vision and loss of eye, uh, blackening and ulceration of the heart palate, we have seen about 70% of the cases. So the take home point is during this now second wave of pandemic, we are having people with advanced clinical features coming initially more than 50 to 60 percent. And like Mohan said, as the awareness is going to become more and more over a period of time in the near future, you will find patients will come only with darkening of the mucosa in the nose with a little pain. And that is where you will catch it early as a sinus involvement. That's a very nice take home point. Now, quickly, has anybody in the panel seen? I'm going fast because I wanted to cover up more questions. I only hope that the panelists would uh, bear up with me. Cerebral involvement, has there, I mean, we, I have not seen, has any of the panelists seen cerebral involvement? Five yes, sir. Uh, is by Dr. Yes, sir. What about yes, sir. Five yeah. One, yes, sir. Internal carotid thrombosis I have seen. Internal carotid. That means the patient had uh, hemiplegia? Uh, no, but uh, it's a, I mean, thrombus was detected in the angiogram. Normally they present with hemiplegia, so I was just wondering whether. Are you talking about cavernous sinus? Or is it cavernous sinus thrombosis? Not seen. Right. So we have now, seen in quickly, one patient. Uh, Satyakiran, you have seen in so, one case. Uh, yeah, intracranial extension that is of stage three, uh, Rupatel classification. Uh, the anterior cranial fossa was involved in two cases, and cavernous sinus thrombosis was seen in one patient out of 34. Okay. Now, here I have to ask you, Satyakiran, one important thing. What would be your early clinical sign if you're thinking of a cavernous sinus thrombosis? Early. <laughs> Two things. One is the venous uh, symptoms, chemosis of the eye or in conjunctiva and neurological symptoms, a facial palsy or a absence palsy. What about corneal anesthesia? Uh, uh, because of the conjunctive edema, we will not be able to uh, look for the conjunctival or the corneal uh, sensations. I'm with you on that. Once the yeah, corneal yeah. edema has set in, uh, but you need to keep in mind if there is no corneal edema, a corneal anesthesia will also give you a little sign whether the patient is going in for this cavernous sinus thrombosis, especially saw, with the vision loss. I saw a case of isolated cavernous sinus thrombosis I told you earlier. Right. And... Uh, yeah. Uh, Who's hello? on the lab? Uh, yes. Sir, sir, sir. sir, I have seen oh, four cases with... Please go ahead. Mm. I have seen four cases with facial paralysis and uh, two out of them eventually developed the cerebellar and pontine infarcts. Mucor? And, yes, uh, mucor. Even, uh, even, even I have seen a facial paralysis case. And okay. facial paralysis is a very early sign indicating of uh, intracranial involvement. 
and most of the time we miss it because of the facial edema and the eye is already uh, there is proptosis so we may not be able to assess properly but this is an early indicator for uh, following pontine and cerebellar infarcts agree so here oh, there is one important one one important take home point we have to give all the people all the people who are participating that post covid from the 10th day to 50th day where we are viewing patients with diabetes or steroid usage or any other thing this is the window period where they can develop mucor so our may, way of going about is 10th to 50th day is what is the most crucial part and we have to keep this point in mind sir one point to add do we need yes. to add uh, the anticoagulants on that to prevent the neurological issues yes sir yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, the i think we should have taken uh, vishnu's opinion also pertaining yeah. to a particular part of See, it on our, on our, on our own, on our own I don't think we can add on the, on those things because that requires you know angiogram neurologist opinion condition yeah. see now coming yeah, to the complete the ent examination and nasal endoscopy all your cases on nasal endoscopy had some sign or the other the i mean the panelists would definitely agree to that isn't it we are seeing a normal nasal endoscopy picture when we go into the mid middle meatus then we may see some little pus sometimes sometimes we may not see also in early cases i have seen a case with uh, you know where there was a very small uh, cyst like picture in the ct scan mm -hmm. in shadow i mean soft tissue shadow in the floor mm. but that patient came with a pain but the nasal endoscopy was normal only the mri clinched the diagnosis sometimes we may miss in early cases i agree the classical classical previous pictures like black ash on septum and turbinates may not be there in every case true right that is becoming less and less in the in this period so if you see sinus infection is the most common presentation now here is my question to you all is it the maxillary sinus or is it the ethmoid uh satyakiran uh, uh, in your in my your case question. in 32 cases out of 34 ethmoids are involved so it is the anterior ethmoids which is most commonly involved next question anand acharya which is the one is it ethmoid or maxillary uh, ma maxillary uh, to begin with then it spreads to the ethmoids it is maxillary first or ethmoids first maxillary first oh dr b navin are you there okay uh manushrut hello yeah sir i in your cases what you have done is it the maxillary or the ethmoid which is common no maxillary is common anyway but uh, i have a different perspective on this particular slide sir hello i'm ready yes sir see yes please. the sinuses per se are not that involved it is the peri sinus soft tissues and peri antral peri sinus tissues that are being involved the pterygoid turbinates pterygoids are the preferred side sometimes the pterygo palatine fossa infra temporal fossa are the preferred sides per se sinuses usually they appear normal and uh, there is nothing much we can do in the sinuses you have to Uh, remove the disease around the sinuses peri sinus and peri antral and uh, pterygoid which i i am with you venkatra reddy on that i am with you now my question is very simple once if the sinus is involved is it the ethmoid or the maxillary see my main point is that we need to understand are we just overlooking ethmoid whether the ethmoid is the center focus from where everything it is going in all different directions that is my point okay okay that's the only reason why i wanted to bring in this particular thing and what you had said about the sites i have a, a slide and we will discuss in detail about that okay okay now now coming to the investigations part of it we all know now that mri is more important than ctpns 
but both are helpful if we take both the pictures i think all the you know panelists are with it so that we don't really work up in detail pertaining to it there's only one point i want to ask that these patients when we are taking up for surgery in covid testing what is the test you people are asking for dr mohan reddy see all the covid uh, uh, inflammatory markers already specific test whatever is written over there any specific test you ask for the covid uh, covid specific inflammatory markers i ask them immediately to go for that apart from neutro to know to look for the neutropenia and all i mean the specific which you have mentioned i do covid test specific covid test to the right ferritin ferritin and crp Oh, oh. those are all indirect markers mon i am talking about the direct part of it before going for surgery you mean uh, blood, blood investigations or uh, radiologic do you do you rule out that the patient is got active infection of covid or not what test do you do crp c reactive protein is rt pcr uh, you mean rt pcr we have to do Oh, you do do RT PCR, Doctor Meghnath. Sir, uh, after if the fourteen days has crossed from the time the patient had symptoms or RT PCR positive, then we'll go ahead with the HRCT test because RT PCR can be positive even there is no viable virus particles in the throat and nasopharynx. Agreed. The, agreed. The non-viable particles can be picked up by the RT PCR. That is the, even the WHO recommends to. Know, there is no role of testing, retesting uh, after the diagnosis of the COVID-19. HRCT chest has shown choroid 5, choroid 6. Yeah. So, so the, you, the, the important HRCT thing also takes a long time to resolve the email. So all these yes, things. I agree with you. We need. We no. need. We need. Mon, I'm, Mon, I'm arriving at a particular point and that's yeah, the reason yeah. why I'm bringing in this. See, yeah. whenever we say choroid five, choroid six, like Mohan has said, it takes some time to resolve. But at the same time, like Dr. Meghnath has said, that you know, RT-PCR could be negative, but still yeah. there is a certain amount of positivity. So, do we do IgG, IgM, or is anybody doing CBNAT? Is anybody doing CBNAT? Oh, your idea is to know whether there is active disease or not. Is that yes. your question? Yeah. Yes, that is my question. Yeah, I think any of these tests will not give any idea about the active disease after some time, after about say four weeks, four weeks at least, after four weeks. See, because all these tests are sometimes, you know, they have got their own variables. Please understand this is seen from the 10th day to 50th day of COVID. 10th right. day to 50th day. When we are taking these patients up for surgery, we need to be sure whether these patients are COVID positive or COVID negative. There is definitely a vague thing of RT-PCR. There is definitely a vague thing about HRCT chest. Is there any other test that we can do? Antibodies will give like, you know, hepatitis B antibody. If they have a good amount of antibodies like that, even with hepatitis B cases, Manushrut, we take up can cases. you can you brief anything that you people are doing at Yashoda, Manushrut? Actually, uh, we are taking even patients with uh, who are active COVID positive, uh, RT PCR positive, or CT chest positive. We are operating in a separate OT, taking all precautions. So because any delay is causing more problem to the patient, but uh, there are no so, other. Yes. So you. Definitely do uh, RT PCR and RT PCR is your ma main diagnostic point to say COVID positive or COVID negative. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I got it clear. Satyakiran, it's the same thing with you all, or you don't even bother about it. Uh, sir, we do RT PCR and HRCT chest. Wonderful, Doctor B Navin. Anything you would like to add? Okay. HRC HRCT for pulmonary pulmonary function capacity pulmonary for anesthesia. Is Dr. G B S Rao there? No. Even okay. COVID positive cases, we have to to save the organ. We have to operate. So, irrespective of whether positive RT PCR positive or negative, it is irrespective. Uh, 
uh, with all the measures we are operating, the prime aim is to save vision and the life of the patient. So, uh, what tests do you do at Sunshine? Uh, yeah, RT PCR, HRCT. RT PCR, HRCT. Wonderful. Yeah. Then I'll introduce a new test to all of you. You can just read it up a little bit. This is called CBNAT. The CBNAT is a gene expert test. The specificity and uh, positivity is more than 90%. You'll get the result in one hour time. And it is supposed to be more specific than RT-PCR and more specific than rapid antigen test. And it would definitely be of help, especially if you're planning to take the patient up immediately for surgery, just to see whether the patient is COVID plus or COVID minus. So that is one test. It is being done in Hyderabad. You can find out more details about it. So radiological part of it. Pardon me? Many patients are presenting. Many patients are presenting in advanced stage, like uh, sudden loss of vision, blurring of vision. So uh, not going with the test. Like we are not waiting for the test, but immediately we are posting for surgery next day or the second day. Wonderful. Now, this particular slide, what I'm putting forward is a very important slide because I think these are the tests that might help us to see how our prognosis is going to be. Like Dr. Mohan Reddy has also pointed out in terms of IL-6 or serum keratin, when these are increased with lymphopenia and neutropenia, invariably your prognostic rates are not that good and we have to concentrate on platelet counts because otherwise if the counts are low and we overlook it there is a possibility of bleeding while we are operating there's a one question here as we have started amphotericin b does crp and esr have a role to play to see whether the drug is acting and the disease is coming down anybody uses this as a thing Satyakiran uses that. Yes, and, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Anand, yes, sir. rest of all of you use. I think that's wonderful. Then we have finished with this. Now, quickly coming to pre anesthesia thing, we are working out the whole thing in pre anesthesia part, whatever is there written here. What I want to know mainly is how many of you are doing this surgery under local anesthesia? Okay, Dr. Dr. Kiran, Dr. Navin is doing under local and Dr. Mohan? Local, local, very limited cases, limited cases, somewhere where we can like, not. So, what do you mean by limited, sir? Uh, we are able to do even endoscopic medial maxillectomy under local anesthesia. What do you mean by limited? Suppose if you go into the orbital apex or pterygoids, then I don't think so. Yes, yes. And if the maxilla is involved, only middle maxillectomy part probably you can do. But a dentist and all, it will be a very painful Actually, thing. Actually, Mohan, the, the maxillofacial yeah. surgeons do a medial maxillectomy, maxillectomy under local anesthesia and regional anesthesia. Oh. They don't want so there are anesthesia. 14 cases under local anesthesia. Soft tissues, inflamed, inflamed disease, soft tissues. No, no. I am also tissues. like you, Mohan. I am also like you. I, like, I don't like doing um, too many things under local. I would so like to have the comfort. Can you can do certain cases selectively, no issue. See, it all depends on that individual's aptitude and correctiveness. Like, for example, I know that one of my team members goes up right into the sphenoid under local and even drills the whole thing comfortably and does it. Dr. Navin is there, he does it. But you ask me to do, I won't do it. I'm not too comfortable doing it. So it, it is the individual aptitude. Career, but my point why I'm saying this is today there is a you know gross need for surgeons to do most of the surgeries under local because you can save time you can save money and some patients are not fit for general anesthesia so when they're not fit for general anesthesia nicely Vishnu has said yes. debridement is first followed by medication so my, select, select, my selective indication goes there also. So one thing to say, the I say is we have to do it under local anesthesia. Correct. It's yes. Very, very important that we do it. Lung we have to look for the lung reserve of the patient. We have to look for the lung reserve of the patient. 
yes yes yeah that's a fitness question of fitness yes we have to no so yeah. that is one point i would definitely like to stress that all ent surgeons even at district level if you are comfortable to do under local anesthesia i want quick tips for local anesthesia surgery 2 minutes by satya kiran and 2 minutes by dr b navin to just tell what is it that you people do so that the patients are comfortable sir i had one or two tips hello sir, sir one thing sir. is hello yeah satya kiran go ahead uh, hello sir i am dr venkatram reddy here sir yeah okka sari satya kiran maatladanaka venkatram reddy meer cheppandi okay sir right thank you sir the first thing what we need to know is the mucosa is first insensitive so there is not not much role of infiltration but still as a part of a routine we infiltrate 2% xylocaine mixed with adrenaline in the apex of the middle turbinate in the ancinate 2 portion and in the sphenopalatine region we finish the fest on one side pack the nose once again with merosil which is again adrenaline concentrated with uh, 4% xylocaine do the surgery on the other side and come back for medial maxillectomy on the opposite side once again by infiltrating in the inferior meatus and in and around the inferior turbinate wonderful navin is there something that you would like to add 4% xylocaine with adrenaline packing so initially creating a space as satyakiran said sensitivity and the bleeding is very less in all the necrotic areas so what we have seen in advanced cases in elderly with severe diabetics more than 71 year old 81 year old where the lung reserve is very less <coughs> so we could not get a ga clearance and uh, the demand and supply of oxygen the institutes was mismatch there was a mismatch so we have to cases we have to take the cases on a emergency basis and uh, 4% xylocaine with adrenaline and infiltration with 2% xylocaine the packing is the most important thing second is inferior turbinectomy is giving us good space in the nostrils and uh, we could do very good medial maxillectomy white medial medial antrostomy and most of the patients the inferior turbinate is necrosed so we can easily gouge it out mallet and gouge it out it's almost like a dankers procedure and in invariably all the cases are having the focus of infection is in the floor of the maxilla where we can see see the pores and uh, the blackish dark fluid as well as the anterolateral wall of the maxilla junction of the anterior and lateral wall got it uh, I, yes i think it is we got a clear cut picture there's only one point i want to add do not sedate these patients when you are doing under local anesthesia we are not especially preferably avoid sedation you can give analgesia but no sedation at all no yes, dr venkatram reddy back to you you wanted to say something yeah, i only think is just highlighting the surgery under la local anesthesia i think we had a lot of experience in governmental setting yes we used to do pan sinusoid sensitivity all sinuses full of polypi when one one can do that case i think it is very easy to do in the post covid situation of mucor since uh, this of uh, the mucor offers a lot of uh, avascular necrosis and hardly any bleeding number 1 number 2 there is a nerve endings are already you know the anesthetized by the disease itself yes so yes. you don't have to infiltrate you don't have to infiltrate much you don't have to pack it uh, to uh, achieve a avascular field as well so only thing is you have to take care of the normal tissues where you are taking out or drilling or whatever it is Perfect. and i think one can one can do explore the entire maxilla by modified dankers or close the pterygo palatine fossa infra temporal fossa and we have seen though internal maxillary artery is being completely uh, blocked completely necrosed thrombos thrombos yeah uh, thrombos and you can you can as it is you can debride it and in some cases the reports are there where anteriorismal artery is completely thrombosed you can actually yeah. debride it absolutely without any bleeding 
So yeah. I think local one has to do it, even if you don't have, you're not used to also. It's a wonderful take on point. Yes, sir. It's a wonderful take on point. All the ENT surgeons at district level should do it. They should do, they should help these patients out. They don't need to come to Hyderabad to be crowded over here. You people can do a wonderful job. And then if need be, start off on amphotericin and let me tell you, at least you're giving them a chance. We can always do a salvage surgery final part at a later date. But now sir, you have, it has sir, to be have, done in the local. You have raised a very good point that patients should not be too much sedated in these cases. Yes. yes. And you must put a big sponge, very big sponge with uh, some pressure. You have to uh, block entire coena. So that the blood will not spill into the throat because in case of even drilling of the pterygoid, you can easily drill the pterygoid and go to orbital apex as well with a sponge in the with a very big sponge which should not slip it out slip down into the throat uh, so that this will offer you know like a throat pack in so general, so i have Hello. a better suggestion for it use pediatric police catheters on the pediatric police catheter you only infiltrate air not saline and then nicely block it it'll it'll be very yeah. good and very comfortable as, as you can do in a better hospitals but this is the cheapest way you just to take a big sponge, you know, uh, the, um, the cot, the uh, uh, sponges are there in any, any cot. You can dig a sponge, sterilize it, and then tie a thread. And the thread has to be in the antinasal uh, outside the vestibule. Yeah. So here comes the question about the predilection sites. It is clearly mentioned the predilection in the order. My question is, I think Satyakiran agreed to it that maximum number of his patients had ethmoids. And let me tell you, maximum yes, number of our patients also ethmoids were involved. Without an ethmoidal yes. involvement, only maxillary involvement was not there. Always ethmoids were involved. So that is something I think we need to keep in mind. It doesn't mean that the ethmoids are going to get avascular and necros. But you will find the disease in ethmoids, especially when you're removing, there'll be hardly any bleeding. That is an indication that the ethmoids are involved. That is one point that you need to take into consideration. And now coming to this particular part about the role of the surgery, we all agree that it is removal of revitalized tissue, debulking, and histopathology diagnose. And uh, we agree about the antifungal also, nothing much to this is something I would definitely like a quick discussion. You know, I was going to an article that was put forward by Dr. Santosh G. Hanover, who is the editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, not ENT. And look at the way he has proposed a staging of rhino orbitocerebral mucormycosis. Stage 1 into A, B, C, and D. The involvements you see these are the involvements we are seeing clearly. Like, you know, like Venkatram Reddy has said, nasal mucosa involvement. That is only nasal, not sinus. Stage 2, he has put forward where it is paranasal sinus involvement and different things. And stage 3 talks about orbit involvement and stage 4 talks about CNS. I must commend this particular uh, eye surgeon to go into such details to really give us a staging of this. And I tried to, you know, be very critical about this staging. But I felt that it was very nice, this particular staging, to help us in terms of our management and therapy. Sir, he is from Hyderabad. All of you have read this. Center first. Meghna, you have read this also, isn't it? Yes, sir. He is from uh, Hyderabad. Yes, Hyderabad. it's from Hyderabad. He's uh, Center for Sight. He's in charge yes, of the Center for Sight. He's done a wonderful job. We really have to commend him about that. Sir, this so is, this, I, think, I think this classification is too good because it, it gives the prognostic value also. Exactly. It definitely gives a prognostic value and the way you can go about and operate. So I would like you to download that and each and every one of us should go through it and maybe put it into practice. So, we know that the surgical debridement is the fundamental to success of management of mucormycosis. So, all my ENT colleagues have to understand surgery is one followed by amphotericin B. So, don't hesitate, take the patients up for surgery. 
this is very very important that the patient has to to enhance survival you have to operate then start on medication Vinay, one point. One point. Yes, Mohan. On the staging, on the staging that the, so much of elaborate this thing, ophthalmologist has given in that the ophthalmic related like uh, lacrima and scavenous those parts as definitely. I Even the ophthal part, they have done a the good job. The ophthal minus part, that's it. He has done a very good job. In the end, I still I still say that is for endoscopy approach. It is a disease, one sign, one nasal yes. cavity, nasal cavity, lateral wall, medial wall of the orbit, like that, you know, the extent, depending on the extent of the disease. I feel that helps a lot. I will put it to you all people. What now? Which I applied in 2000. I can put it to our people. That will be very useful to reach to the suppose uh, classified as stage three when it has reached to tergo palatine fossa and D. Mohan, I have a, I have a, I mean, have a small uh, suggestion. Mohan, I have a small uh, suggestion. And when I cross beyond the, beyond the lateral wall into the infratemporal fossa or intracranial, I put it as stage four, where you no know, this classification helps us. To decide our approaches like only medial maxillectomy or making it a dinkers, depending on the extent like that. And the severity of extent of the disease and the complexity of the surgery will, will be involved in that. So this class, that classification which she has made, they have made, that's a more elaborate on the sites of involvement. A lot of sites of involvement they have elaborated, enumerated. I appreciate it because it's an eye surgeon who has done a good job. I've appreciated an that. Eye surgeon cannot part. classify that. Cannot put a, which is required for us, you know, for the surgeon endoscopy surgery. They cannot classify. We are the people who are experienced in putting the right kind of tool, using the tool, extent of the dissection, all those things. We can only decide about the classification on our endoscopy approach. I mean, I appreciate their effort their effort and related to the eye and all those things even the scavenger sinus i don't know but they, they have made a compilation that's a good point they have made all the things now the coming to this one maxillofacial infection the latest trend in mucormycosis management is to use less disfiguring surgical procedures not jump straightly at total maxillectomies and all that, but it has to be less disfiguring. And this is where we need to understand, do we really need to involve a maxillofacial surgeon who are much more competent to do less disfiguring surgeries? This is just a loud thinking. It is not that we have to, but we have to keep this one point in mind. No, and have... second important point I wanted to put across is, we don't need to do debridement in one sitting. You can do debridement in multiple sittings as comfortable as possible because you may not be comfortable doing in one sitting. Do one, start the treatment and again do little, little debridement, especially for ENT surgeons who are practicing at district levels who find it a little difficult in their settings. This is a very nice way of going about is what I thought I'll put forward. Now, now comes the microbiology part of it. Uh, I think all the panelists agree that we all refer this uh, the, this for the microbiology part testing, isn't it? Yes. All of us send it. We always yes, get sir. this particular report. Here, yes. there is only two points I found is that that we need to have a direct collaboration with the microbiologist. We should not just read the report, but speak to them. And secondly, our pieces have to be small pieces and not grounded pieces to be sent for them. That is the second thing, and it should be sent in saline. It should not it be should. sent in any other thing. It should be sent in saline. Not even saline. I have discussed with the microbiologist. They asked me, I don't know, to send a specimen directly immediately without putting anything. A sterile container, just like that. They sterile. Don't know. 
I don't know. I that's what their suggestion. This what I'm taken is from the literature that is there. And uh, see, fungal smear, you if will get the report. It should be very minimal saline, sir. Yes. If at all, it should be very little saline. Yes. yes. <laughs> little saline very is little that, saline. Not a lot of saline. <laughs> and uh, smear, you will get the result in within a matter of two to three hours. Correct. You can get the result. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. And uh, we should understand that blood cultures are rarely positive. There, there's no role for blood culture at all. Mm -hmm. And okay. we should get a report maximum within three to five days. We cannot wait for weeks together for that report. That is something that we should know. So pathology part, histopathology is uh, perfect. And here is the thing that I wanted to discuss with you is, if we do a radical surgery, our success control is 90%. If we do a partial one, it is about 41.6. I think even partial removal is better than not removing at all. You all agree with me? Yes. So, he said somewhere we ENT surgeons can could put this point across to any physician who is admitting and treating these cases that you cannot waste your medication on them, but to first get a ENT thing done. Why I, would, uh, I agree, sir. I, I agree. Agree. Agree, but the partial surgeons, I mean, as you said, no, this is an emergency like in districts, they should do and but they should immediately ask them to send to their more expertise. Yeah, after they have finished yeah. and they have stabilized the patient, they are most yeah, they should not they should not the up, or they should not hesitate or anything that's important. Sir, uh, I think they should uh, plan to do a full surgery. Probably this is the situation where they can do without any fear of complications because exactly. uh, the field will be good. There won't be any bleeding. So they should plan for a complete surgery. I think I'm with uh, Dr. Meghnath on that. It will be quite comfortable here. Prevention, control and protection. There is a very important question I want to ask. I'll start with Dr. Meghnath to be brief. You are operating mucor mycosis surgery. What are the chances of surgeon, anesthetist, and the sisters and other getting mucor in the operation theater? And how do you prevent it? Sir, uh, th this risk is absolutely minimal. <laughs> because this mucor is anyway present in the environment. But in the operation theaters, because of the HIPAA filters in the operating room, laminar so flow, the risk HIPAA is filter. almost negligible. Even if HIPAA you don't filter. have HEPA filters also, even an ordinary filters also filter the fungus. <laughs> so the risk to the operating team depends on not on the environment, but their individual <laughs> diabetes control. Okay. If a staff member is not is having uncontrolled diabetes, yes, he, he should not have the comorbidities. Right. The staff should uh -huh. not have the comorbidities. Right. Uh, Dr. Venkatram Reddy, would you like to add something? I think, sir, I think uh, perfect. What Meghnath has said, I am fully agree with him. And uh, right. with reference to, sir, the, your previous slide, I have a uh, little comment in the present scenario, sir. Please go ahead. Hey, you are, you are, we are asking and recommending the surgeons at the district level and taluk level to go ahead with the debridement. And the, yes. practical, the practical scenario is the amphotericin is not available there. So, if they do only surgical Between, between you and me, Dr. Venkat Ram Reddy, Dr. Satish had made a statement in, in Siddipet, yes. the, <laughs> present ML, the present minister is able to get amphotericin B for the patients admitted there. But you and me cannot get it in our hospitals over here. Yeah, that's what we I understand. Now we don't we get it in our hospitals. The, they will get it in Siddipet. Here in the city, we are refusing the cases for the want of amputation and we are not doing surgery because that's not correct not no, no, no. See, that i am asking correct. about present scenario venkatram reddy that's why at taluk level or district level let them do and when the thing is better here let them sir, send sir, if they do surgery sir practically if they do surgery and don't give amputation after that i think you are opening up many many channels there i think that will further aggravate 
if the amphotericin is not given it may it may go into the blood stream and uh, disseminated uh, mucor uh, is the problem i i personally had asked this question to dr vishnu rao in the first thing he okay. said with the lack of the he said sir even with that please go ahead please yeah, yeah. that's go what ahead. was telling do it. you do but it don't leave it. it yeah yeah do the surgery posoconazole is available you can give the tablets of posoconazole so if it's available give it so what i'm saying is somewhere we need to we can't allow these patients to come all the way to hyderabad and run around here there yes, yes i agree but the, even the posoconazole is not available sir posoconazole is not available sir. in the district sir venkata medi one minute yes, sir. see the amphotericin amphotericin okay medical treatment is to control the disease but you know opening the channels that is all you know when the planes are opened like you know that is the thing see the dead tissue whatever is possible if they can remove and send remove when the patient cannot reach here that is the case of situation i am telling the people who cannot reach for them at least some amount of debridement also will help it is a dead tissue which they are going to remove and throw off i am with mon the amphotericin amphotericin has I to be given if it is uh, available earlier, yeah, earlier they used to be posoconazole available now the tablets of posoconazole, no, no, posoconazole are available. amphotericin whatever is available you have to give there is no second thought on that i think uh, i think dr meghnath has answered the question beautifully if there is comorbidities they should be careful to go and operate if somebody without comorbidities the chances of getting the infection is very minimal hepa filter has a add on advantage but regular filter can also take care but i just want to add one more important thing pertaining to it the thing that i want to add is from the anesthesia point of view that if it is done under local anesthesia it is fine but if it is under general anesthesia the anesthetist need to protect himself in terms of everything because he is intubating the airway and we always see to it that the filter and the tubing of the anesthesia tube to be changed every case every case the filter and the tubing has to be changed you cannot allow that to happen at all it should not be present and uh, i think with this we should be able to operate these cases of mucor now if the surgeon is immunocompromised is a diabetic and other things it is better that surgeon avoids it and somebody else who is not go ahead and operate i think that is the point mainly in terms of prevention for surgeon and others getting it same thing holds good for the sisters and in terms of tissue disposal also has to be very clear tissue disposal has to be done in the standard disposable manner that is when our chances of infecting others will not be there we all agree that this is a multidisciplinary approach thing and we all need a multidisciplinary management for mucormycosis and i don't think it does require a lot of major discussion pertaining to it but i want to put this one point across post covid we are seeing patients not just with mucor i am seeing cases with invasive fungal and i have surprised one year case i have seen invasive candidia where we had to do a complete debridement and what this article talks about is it is not only aspergillus candida mucor even penicillium is also affecting in covid so i want all to have this idea that you are only not looking at mucor you are looking at an array of fungi that can suddenly become active and need not be just the nose it could also be the ear it could also be the ear and ordinary candidiasis of the ear with just candid ear drops is not getting solved this is something post covid you need to observe on that and a quick point in terms of legality you all are aware about this legality part i don't need to say anything but i would definitely say counseling has to be recorded please after you take your documentation everything please record your counseling that is one thing i would like to say 
and to make it a point that on your surgeon's consent you sign with the date and time many times we forget to sign that is something you need to sign and there are three covid documents you have to have before taking these patients up one covid document is giving the surgeon consent for emergency surgery with the witness signature patient and surgeon signature because during this covid time this patient can become covid positive on the fourth or fifth day they should not blame you there should be a self declaration from them given this self declaration is very important and the third one is because of the covid form that they are taking full responsibility for the surgery and if it anything happens to them the surgeon and the hospital is not held responsible i think this legal part has to be kept in mind that this part i'm not giving into a discussion because this is something that we all should know we have to do it a quick discussion on this the first one is non availability of medication like dr venkatram reddy has said dr venkatram reddy yes sir yes uh, sir we have already discussed we'll go ahead with surgery we'll hope for the medication and think the government is taking a stand that it is going to supply do so surgery pray do surgery pray for medication exactly wonderful statement doctor patient relationship empathy we are not operating for money we are operating to help the patient as much as possible help them but so in terms of even if the patient is agreeing to pay cost price we have to help them there are lot of patients who can't afford lot and lot of them who can't afford somewhere they you can't load government ent hospital totally i mean i was shocked in the afternoon when dr anand acharya said 39 cases in one day and uh, dr satyakiran said already 60 patients are admitted how is it humanly possible so somewhere this load has to be taken and that's why i say district levels also people have to operate after taking the consent that's why i said overload of cases in government and private hospital we have to do some public awareness attendance and this i am asking dr uh, you know both ramesh and dr satish from the association of otolaryngologists telangana to take up this awareness thing in a big manner this awareness is very important from the EM, ent point of view the Sir, early the detection early the detection awareness. hello yes right point the awareness is so much that every day we are getting two patients hale and healthy post covid only no complaints just check for mucor black fungus no the awareness what what sam is telling is about the early detection method yes. and at the district level that our our colleagues have to be educated and our colleagues have to take up that is important i think it is a very important thing our association has to take lead in that i think dr ramesh and satish are very very able and right people for that kind of awareness in our own faculty and i think there should be a 24 by 7 helpline by the government and also the private sector as they players together and in this helpline they should be able to guide these people where to go and which are the places at district level or which are the places at city level that these patients have to go otherwise they are lost they are running sam, here there sam, everywhere sam a new yeah. point uh, one point which you made the awareness is important and there are people who cannot afford anything and we should you have, you have put some uh, tackle points there but you know what is happening i will give an example i don't hesitate you know that i don't has means words you know this is the awareness in our faculty association we have to create one patient an example i am telling came from coastal area 30 year old samir his wife is an ventilator is three three year old or three months old i don't remember child is with pair with their uh, in laws and he came with potentially blind hypotan and chepocharu and he told me he is broke when he came here heard that it cost 10 lakhs for me 10 lakhs is nothing i am talking of 20 lakhs 
yeah what whatever it is already they are already they are broke with spending and uh, she is on ventilator and they must have been totally you know bankrupt by now and i am only making this thing. this is there so that is why you have made a very good point our association has to take a lead for the district doctors we have to educate and train also yes yes early detection and now the dentists left and right everybody can do yes i'm telling dentists will help us to reach to any areas in this mucor mycosis i'll tell you this is not like tumors are not like these things already all the tissues are dead all the bones are dead it is not that difficult to reach to the deep areas with a very little if we take the lead the ent association we can help our people a lot you know it, it, i don't know how they can spend like that how they can charge like that so much i don't know the adi we will not discuss no is that no, is sam you you brought the point i am only saying that we have to help in this no, epidemic we are, we are we are only talking about our association this is association program yeah. Yeah. our association under satish and ramesh they have to take a lead in yeah. creating awareness and training our colleagues the government initiatives are very good i have seen the andhra pradesh I government i don't believe in government initiatives these days see the people are dying like you know rats whatever it is mohan initiative see associations our associations should become proactive we are part of the government we can think of that no only government cannot do Good. so finally i think this has been a wonderful discussion that the right you are hesitating sam you brought all the points but when it's coming to put the right points in the right it do 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 Oddu Mohan, Oddu. This is the. No, I am telling Ramesh and Satish to take a lead. All these could do. They can. They can take you to help so many people to train and you know train our juniors. You know. So when we are talking of rhino oculo cerebral mucor mycosis, keep three words, beautiful words again from that ophthalmologist article I picked up. Possible mucor, probable mucor. proven mucor that is where we ent surgeons are needed possible probable proven and then guide the patients help as many patients even a one life saved is a blessing for us and i really wish all our ent doctors take this epidemic in a big manner and try and help out and each ent surgeon should help another ent surgeon in treating the patients and we should be available 24 by 7 to help them out so that everybody as many people come out of this epidemic alive and will be thankful to us and we should be thankful to god for being with us i thank all the panelists and i thank all the participants for being a part of here and if you look at my closing slide tough times don't last tough teams do those who endure conquer the harder you work for something the greater you will feel when you achieve it all the best to all of us and let us hope for the best satish satish and ramesh thank you sir thank you for your efforts and okay. dean dayal i told him before only you are the right person for such kind of a thing you have done wonderfully well thank you mohan is the need of our sir that is the reason why we have selected this topic yeah. yes ramesh Thank, thank you, you Dr. Sen and thank you Manushrut and of Sir. course thanks to of course our AOI Telangana team Ramesh and Satish thank you very much for giving me the opportunity no 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 sir <clears throat> sir thank you thank you Dean Dayal sir and thank you all the panelists Dr. Rekatram Reddy sir K R Mehna sir Bhima Reddy sir and Jeevesh Rao sir Satyakiran Manushrut Ananda Chair sir and guest speaker <clears throat> 
Vishwaram sir, Ashi, Ashi madam, and this is, this platform especially to encourage youngsters and our district level doctors, sir. Yeah. As yeah. rightly said by the Mohan Reddy sir, Indal sir, everybody has to know about the muka. This is a crisis. This is a need of power. Every every person has to respond well. So every senior has to back up the junior, and everybody has to do the surgeries comfortably. So thank you very much, sir. I think this is a help, this is a very helpful for all of all of the AY members. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, especially a <clears throat> sincere thanks to Sri Harsha for helping in this format, sir. Once again, this success, uh, successful connection of this was made by only because of this, sir. Shastra ENT Foundation, Sri Harsha. Sir, super, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, you, sir. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. And let us hope that we'll all meet during happy times. Yeah. Yeah. Hope for yeah, happy sir. times.